Okay, we are back. Uh, it is Wednesday, January 18th, uh, 2023. I feel like it was yesterday that I was saying January 2022. So it is moving very fast. I am very excited about 2023. We have a great guest today. Uh, we're missing our own King, Llewellyn King, who is stuck in Abu Dhabi of all places, um, dealing with transportation issues. Uh, but I'm gonna ask our own Dr. John Sibley Butler to kick us off with some music. In the with a dollar in my hand. With that aching in my heart, and my pockets are full of sand, I'm a lonely from home, and I miss my love for so. But in the early morning rain. Oh, Andres, you are muted. Yeah, yeah. Johnny, we that was great, but the, the guitar didn't come through for some reason. The mic, I don't know what's going on. We need to... We need to try that. Did the guitar you know. come through? Yeah, the, the, you can hear you singing, but the guitar does not. I don't know what's going on with the feedback. So, you know, this all these microphones, they have tricky things. So <laughs> we'll, fi we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Anyway, Johnny, how are you? How was the break? What's your outlook for 2023? What's happening? The break was absolutely fine. I think that the break gave us uh, two things. It gave us a relief, but it also gave us a, there's a lot of planning going down in the break. Mm -hmm. I think the outlook is good. I think that uh, as the uncertainty unlifts, if you look at the economy, I think it's going to continue to do well, both the real economy of goods and services and the digital economy of money and credit. I think the big thing that has come into our lives now is, is, is the war in Europe. It's just amazing how it is a part of the American planning now and how we think about the world and how it is presented on television. It's like, we're not in the war, but we are in the war. But if you look at all of the technologies that's coming along, how people's lives have changed. I saw uh, in, the, in the paper today that uh, the, the city of uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, inviting people to come to Tulsa if they want to work remotely. And, mm. and it's called the new remote uh, uh, process. And Tulsa is one of the first cities to uh, to take advantage of that. I think I think what we call management is is definitely changing, given the dynamics of what people would like to do. The big thing is for people to say, "Well, I don't want to come to work today." Uh, that's that's very very uh, new in America. And the other thing, of course, is is the whole political process that that we're going through. You know, it's been a lot to look at. It's been a lot to think about it. But in all historical periods, innovation and creativity and adjustments have got us through. So now that the holidays are over and, and they had a great MLK day, I think that we're moving forward with the, uh, with the new year of 2023. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah, I think that, you know, it's... Um a lot going on still on unpacking and uh, hopefully uh, the change that we got um uh in 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 maybe outlook and, and priorities coming up will will create some more stability uh, sometimes it's good for the for the powers of being not to do much uh and let the let life go on <laughs> so so we'll figure it out but I think that it's going to be interesting how 2023 gets impacted by all these trillion dollars that are being invested for, to build some significant infrastructure changes. And uh, so hopefully this year we'll start seeing some of that impact. But but let me let me go to Jen and say hi to Jen. Jen, how are you? 
Oh, I'm doing fabulously. Thanks, Andres. Good, good. So I'm sitting here in a, in a special place in my heart, a beach that I grew up in, uh, in South America. And uh, John is sitting in Austin. And, uh, and where are you, Jan? I am in my home in Fort Bragg, California. So it's up on Highway 1, right on the yeah. coast. Yeah. And yeah. it's, yeah, absolutely. It was sunshiny today and it's all cloud or sunshiny yesterday and it's all cloud covered today. I think we have one more storm coming. So, so California then, seems to continue to get a lot of interesting weather. What's any of that impacted you yet? Um, the whiplash parts of it are impacting us just because mm -hmm. it was super dry. So they had sections of the ground that were like collapsing because the water, was, it was so dry that the pockets mm -hmm. that are normally filled up with water were collapsing. And that was happening in November and December. And now we've got all this water in the ground can't even absorb it. So wow, it's wow. such a strange thing to, we're still, we moved from severe drought to extreme drought in right. general. Right. But it's so weird to see that with standing water. So it's um it's super schizophrenic. <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Well, for those of you that uh, don't know Jan, Jan is the founder and CEO of Blue Banyan. And um and uh, she's gonna be with us for the hour. And we're very excited about that. And um, and um, before Blue Band, and she'll explain Blue Banding, which is really a, I call it a next generation cloud computing platform provider. Um, so we'll, she'll, we'll get into that. Uh, Blue Before Blue Banding, Jan was the, the owner of iCube I, I Design. Uh, she was also a computer consultant at Solvent or Solvent G. Uh, and then she was a director of application development at Priceline.com, you know, one of those new hot uh, platform companies that changed the way, you know, you buy travel and other things nowadays. Jan holds a BS in uh, chemical engineering from Montana State University from Bozeman. So welcome, Jan. Thank you very much, Anderson. I'm glad to be here. Absolutely, absolutely. So Jan, tell us, tell us about Blue Banyan. And how, how you come about uh, creating the company and, and what are you up to these days? So Blue Banyan is a mission-driven company. This is my legacy. This is the change I want to see in the world. Mm -hmm. So our mission is to create game-changing systemic shifts that make power, prosperity, and opportunity broadly accessible. Mm -hmm. And we are absolutely serious about our mission. So we have defined a whole new metric, similar to some of the new metrics um, that have improved the GDP, but ours is called genuine prosperity that works for me personally in mm. deciding when I'm done, like when I'm actually doing better year on year than I did the year before. And it's got breakdowns, like you have to have inorganic infrastructure, but you have to have organic infrastructure. And mm. if that organic, those natural reserves ever go to zero, then it's game over. So you can't ever get them to zero. So personally, that means like, if you're dead, like none of this matters, right? right. <laughs> but it applies to our community and our environment as well. So that's, it's been really great for me to define my definition of done mm -hmm. um, as part of establishing these game-changing systemic shifts mm -hmm. that we need to see to know that we are actually improving year over year versus just getting richer, producing more, consuming more, that's mm -hmm. a hamster wheel that um, obviously isn't sustainable. So we got to change the frame. So that was one of the great things that came out of my reflections on 2022 in general. And I'm super excited to right. work with that. Um, the other thing that to know about Blue Banyan is that we are focused on setting up a platform for solar installers so that they can deploy more solar faster. Mm -hmm. In that it builds natural reserves, it increases productivity, it reduces bad consumption, and it's just absolutely spectacular building the infrastructure, increasing the natural reserves, and increasing networks. Right. Right. So right. 
all of the pieces that that uh, feed my heart in this end game are done by helping solar installers. And in 2023, we're going to be extending that to cover electricians with our builder success product. Wow, wow, that's great. Oh, well, so, so hold, on, hold on, Johnny, real quick, let me amplify here. So, let, so I wanna make sure that we, when we talk about, you know, sort of being this backbone, Jan, of, you know, call it, you know, industrial digitalization, right? And focus on the solar and construction and all these things at the beginning, but ultimately more things, right? And we track a lot here, you know, all this digital transformation, things that are going on, telecommunications, 5G, data centers, you know, it's smart cities, smart buildings, industry 4.0, you know, it's uh, electrification of transportation, smart energy, the like, right? So we're going to come back at you and try to see how we get you to share more and more what you're doing and maybe what you're thinking going forward. So go ahead, Johnny. Now, I want to get you uh, the business model. So what you're doing is you have a you have a cloud that allow me to measure my success against the world. And so, of course, if it goes to zero, I'm no, no, no longer there. So it is it's like a yearly planner where you can log on to and 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 put what your goals are if you plan to reach those goals. And then you can measure that by year, by date. So I can look back five years from now and just say the following. Five years ago, my plan was to uh, create a great entrepreneur company and my and my metrics were this and this, and I met that amount of metrics, right? You know, what's interesting about that, people have always said that if you want to do something, you write it down. <laughs> That's very mm -hmm. interesting from a philosophical point of view. And when it gets measured, it gets done. And when it gets measured, it gets done. So now, I would guess that you would have a whole lot of competition from the daily planner uh, that, <laughs> that people have traditionally used. You're probably, you're probably not uh, old enough to re remember the daily planner. Uh, <laughs> to, to, to the other integrated uh, to-do lists within... Microsoft and et cetera. So how do you distinguish yourself from the from the to-do list in Microsoft? How do you distinguish yourself from the to-do list in, in, in Google? And what's special about the platform that distinguishes yourself from traditional kinds of let's get it done? So so just to be clear, the genuine prosperity is a relatively new kind of North Star metric for Blue Banyan. It is literally defined and developed in 2022. So it's not fully automated yet. Part of the reason that I think we need this, and, and this is, is just the beginning. We've got other things that are mature in the digital transformation that are happening that we should totally talk about. Mm -hmm. But part of the genuine prosperity is that it's very difficult for me to differentiate between the headlines of all these anecdotal craziness and the trend lines where did you know that the crime rate have gone down by 30 to 40% in most U.S. cities since we let let up on the pandemic restrictions. Hmm. Yeah, you wouldn't actually come out with that storyline, right? All you see right. is that we're shooting children, which is happening, but it's not the trend line. Mm -hmm. And so genuine prosperity for me is a metric for like, are we actually doing better this year than we were last year? And it's meant to be a more global understanding so that I've got a framework and a baseline for reality in which I can put the context of the headlines. Mm. And that's that's what I needed personally, but it's also what, what I need for Blue Banyan, right? We're interested in game-changing systemic shifts mm -hmm. and all of my employees are getting hit by headlines 24 seven. And they mm. need to be able to look up and see that we are actually making progress. So right. this was it is defined as a tool right now for me personally and for our internal use. And I am hoping that as we normalize the data, it's, I have not yet figured out how to calculate the metrics for connection and the networking pieces that are in there against hard infrastructure gains and natural resource reserves, mm -hmm. which by the right. way, you're not just depleting, we should actually be counting how we would build natural resource reserves right. on an ongoing basis. We should be thinking about the end game, which would be actively enhancing our biological health, just like 
you would enhance your physical health with a trainer. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely some of the way that we've approached environmental issues that looks like it's always avoiding the worst case scenario instead of like, you can actually build a positive future. Like there is a place in this scene that is not apocalyptic. Mm. And that's part of the message I would like. Yeah. Stat share. Statistician, Jane, have always said you should we should always look at trend lines rather than headlines. We, and we would say if we want to measure something, we should go at least 10 to 50, 15 years back and then move it forward. And then of course we have ways to to understand whether or not the change is, is uh, significant or not. Of course, we call that, is it statistically uh, 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 significant as we move forward? So so my question is, do you think that this could be, do you see it sometimes uh, interacting with the headlines uh, such that we can give a headline and then go, go back and look at the trends related to that headline? Uh, Absolutely. Th I am hoping that we can say that despite all of these tragic individual events are, are the United States, the genuine prosperity within the United States has increased year over year. I do believe that that is the case in 2022. And I'm still working on the metric. So it's a hypothesis still. But the net crime going down, despite, you know, difficult incidents that have happened throughout the year would be a net gain. And that would be headline worthy. And I would like that to to become part of the story as well. Because if we're always focused on the negative, my kids are just like, I'm afraid to be born and alive and solve problems today because nothing ever matters. And this is a way for me to actually have that dialogue with them that mm -hmm. we are making progress and what we are doing that is right does matter. Because the digital transformation pieces that we're doing are authentically increasing our ability to deploy more solar faster. I agree. You know, the question is what 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 would the data actually say and what do you actually think? What people say and how they think. And I like to say that we are how we think. We get to where we are because of how we think. If we think in a neg negative kind of way, mm -hmm. then it becomes negative. If we think in a positive way, it becomes positive. So you're looking to transform the entire communication structure about the importance of uh, trend lines rather than headlines. And we know, however, that headlines themselves uh, bring lots and lots of attention. Headlines bring lots and lots of revenue. So how do you, how do you put your revenue model going forward on, uh, on, 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 your, on, on, blue, uh, on, on your company? How do you think about that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so Blue Banyan, we're really making our revenue with our our specific game-changing systemic shifts. So we're looking at whether or not we're meeting our goals um, in particular problem domains. So on the solar um, problem domain, where we're looking to increase how much solar is deployed. So we're li literally looking at installed capacity. We're not looking at how much electricity is generated. We're not looking at, at these other metrics because what we need in order to change the trend lines is installed capacity. We mm -hmm. need the installers getting the solar infrastructure out. I expect that in 30 years, that won't be the case. We'll be optimizing for, you know, transmission and, and optimal, you know, supply and demand optimizations will become more of the game. But right now, what we need to meet the climate goals is that we literally have to install the infrastructure to be able to get there. So that's where we're focused right now is that mm -hmm. that particular infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, so we're changing it based on the, the needs of the problems that we're solving at the time. And, and as we analyze the energy um, ecosystem right now, what we need is in, installed capacity. That is our bottleneck. So that's where we're focused and that's what we're measuring. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's going well. So we have been working on several digitization solutions for the entire industry. So we have talked about the common that we've set up the orange button, Department of Energy's orange button initiative with the common terms. So that we've got common language that we're using across the solar industry. Then we've got common data sets with the AHJ registry and we're rolling out the product registry, which is super exciting. And then we're using common tools 
like Solar App from NREL, like Blue Banyan Solar Success, um, Enerflow, Bodhi. We've got several software providers utilizing the tools with both the common terms and the common data sets. So this digitization where we're actually able to build once and use many times is becoming a reality. It's super exciting. We have one of our clients, um, and this is an extreme example, but we have one of our clients that installed Solar Success and we're measuring operational efficiency, which we've determined as revenue per employee. And within 12 months of installing Solar Success, their operational efficiency doubled, more mm. than doubled. So the mm. revenue, the amount of business that each employee was able to process more than doubled over the 12 months. Mm. And if you think about that, literally it's because we're replacing pieces of what people used to do and do kind of poorly and with errors with the automation. For instance, on the AHJ registry, you just put in the homeowner address and it comes back and it tells you which AHJ, which authority having jurisdiction, mm -hmm. where you get your permit for sure, based on the geolocation of that, that line. And it's just done automatically when the sales rep puts in the address. It used to take a person who would have the deep knowledge of where exactly the county lines are and have all this tribal knowledge and then enter the data and hopefully get it right and not be sleepy. And now it, it doesn't even take that 15 minutes per project that it used to take. It's, it doesn't even exist. And so the operational efficiencies are starting to compound mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. that one. And it's exciting because you can deploy more solar faster right. when you've got that kind of operational efficiency. Now, and your operational definitions of what you working with are standardized with no deviations. I mean, your definitions of what it means to be what, what, operationally efficient. Yes. It's, it's super top line, right? Yeah. Like we're just looking at revenue per employee. Mm -hmm. So it's, it is a super basic definition. It does break down into the accounting gets to, you know, we'll actually have higher efficiencies than the people in the field where it's more linear. Every single job, you've got to get up there on the roof and actually install those panels. There are things that we've done to improve the operational efficiency of the field, scheduling and some other things, but they, it's an incremental adjustment because you still have to drive out to the house and actually put them on the roof. Mm -hmm. There are things about this that are more linear than and less digitizable than say the accounting department, which can be substantially automated. And that's, so there are variations, but we're just looking at the top line numbers for the company as a whole. Mm -hmm. Now, when you think about, when you think about that, Jan, I'm thinking, so this is the beginning of that game. Now let's, let's, um, let's push fast forward into imagination. What is Blue Banyan automating five years from now in that ecosystem? You know, I actually have most of the automations I think can still get done in the next 12 months of the automations that are on our roadmap. Mm -hmm. There is so much to still digitize within construction mm -hmm. that we have huge gains that can be made right up front. For mm -hmm. instance, we're pulling in real estate data and just from the counties and real estate places mm -hmm. so that it automatically has the assessor parcel number, which helps the permitting, right? And so tying together these external data sources mm -hmm. so that we get the right information at the right time is pretty much the name of our game right now. So we're looking at these external data sources and we have the main ones identified. And we're in the process of integrating it so it's harmonized to become functional. Mm -hmm. I would love, so the product registry is our next big play. And we're going to be announcing and showing that uh, screenshots and stuff at InterSolar. And that is where we're going to look at all of the products in the solar industry and their, their certifications and standards that they're meeting. So that right now, we're literally asking every single installer out in the field 
mm-hmm. like 250,000 individuals, whether or not this module is certified. Mm-hmm. And then we're asking all of the AHJs and the inspectors to verify that that module is certified mm-hmm. instead of having a central database that says where the certifying agency says, yes, QCell 400s are certified and they're, and they're correctly identified that way centrally. And everybody just checks the one central source and then no human being needs to attest that it's certified or not. We just know because we've checked a central registry. So that product registry is going to bring huge efficiencies Mm -hmm. to the entire industry. Mm -hmm. And that's getting rolled out with the CEC data, the California Energy Commission's list initially. And it's going to be hosted on SunSpec, which Mm -hmm. is the solar standards kind of not-for-profit organization. And it's going to be referenced both by Solar Success and Solar App and Enterflow, so that we're all referencing the same product data. Um, would you like to hear about one of our main insights or technical? Yeah, yeah. Had to yeah get over? Like a case study, then I have a question. Yes. So case studies are are yet to be the case because we're we're still in alpha testing phase right now. Okay. But mm-hmm. one of the things that happens is that the manufacturer's definition of a solar product, they might have ten QCell four hundreds. And the only, and the installers do not want 10 QCell 400s. It's overwhelming. They don't know how to receive that. It's crazy. All they care about is QCell 400s that look regular and QCell 400s that are black on black. That's the only Mm -hmm. thing that they (laughs) care about. And so we have this grouping function in the registry where you indicate what you want to be grouped and we'll return the first of that product so your business can function. So solar installers need to see QCell 400 standard and QCell 400 black on black. But the CEC doesn't even care whether it looks standard or it's black on black. They only care that it's a QCell 400. And Mm -hmm. that's what the certifying agency. So they can have a much smaller list of products and they'll get the first of those products. And the installers can have a slightly bigger list. And then the distributors who are working with the manufacturers can have all of the different nuances of the pieces that they need to get very precise about what it is that they're ordering. And having these different levels of precision, accessing the same core data was one of the key insights that we needed because people care about different things at different level of detail. And solving that problem was one of the key things that we needed to do in order to to effectively move it forward. Otherwise, the installers were like, no, don't give me the same stuff that manufacturers care about. It is TMI. (laughs) Too much information makes me crazy. And so we had to figure out a solution for it. That was one of the key things that came up as we went through this process. It was was totally insightful and not at all what I was thinking would happen. Yeah, yeah. You know, just when we think and look and look comparative to whether or not we're flying airplanes with, with, with no human interaction or whether we're driving cars or whether we're doing the stock market. And and let's just think take the financial models as a as a you know, whether the black shows model or the efficient model. And one of the things that we have said over the years is that as we take out uh the human interaction, the question is, do we need to understand what the humans are actually doing because humans can change their mind. Uh, let me put it a different way. If I'm a physicist and studying rocks, rocks cannot change their mind. On the other hand, if I'm managing these things, I can always change my mind and put something else in the algorithm. Uh, let's call it your data solar algorithm supply chain. I like that, you know, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. So my question is, uh, when you say that uh, the human element is taken out, because uh, the, the human element creates the supply chain, right? I mean, creates the algorithm. Uh, do you have a, a place in the algorithm when something go wrong so that it continuously update or is it a learning system itself or do humans have to go back and, 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 and recreate it? So I guess the big question is, is this supply chain? Is it learning? Is it learning? So, so it is not is it technically... AI learning, no, it's not. But we, what we do is we built in the natural buffers that the humans have used. So 
for instance, if you're doing a 22 panel install on a house, we're going to send you out with 24 panels. Mm. And those two are set aside for breakage because the amount of time it takes to go pick up two more panels and come back is not worth the value of carrying those two extra panels. Mm. When but then when you that- come back to the warehouse, you'll either return the two panels or you'll have some kind of breakage, which will show up in your safety statistics. So when you say that 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 the uh, the government was concerned in with one thing, mm-hmm. wouldn't it be interesting to have the the AI learn that or put that into the AI as a learning rather than having to go back and to uh, and do it manually? So that hey. so the system itself could learn what people actually want rather than the people being themselves disturbed that they don't know the difference between X and Y. So, so here's the thing, Johnny. I'm I love technology, right? I've I've been in software for 30 years. I absolutely love AI. It was one of the first things. As Isaac Asimov, iRobot was one of the pieces I grew up on. And the reality is, we don't need it yet. <laughs> we the the learning on how to do a proper group buy is based on SQL technology that was in 1960. And it's just never been applied to this particular problem. Markov right. chains, we used to call it. Remember the Markov chains in math? That's what it is. But go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, so at some point in time, I do think we're going to come across use cases where this level of precision matters. But the error margin of the pieces that we're correcting and digitizing right now can get handled with these old school 1960 technology really? pieces, really. and. You know, ours is prettier than it was in the 1960s, but it's the fundamental solution for this. This group buy on the SQL with the relational database stuff, that was literally done in the 60s. -hmm. It just was never applied to this. As we get the error margin down and we're able to, to guess, you know, you've got two new people on the crew. And so we're going to expect that you're going to have more breakage than a crew that's more experienced. And so the experienced crew only gets one module extra that goes out with them and the inexperienced gets two. Like we might be able to, to tune it up that way, but right now it's, um, it's overkill. Mm-hmm. So what keeps you up at night? <laughs> about, uh, the, about the solar industry in general? Yeah, 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 the industry and the digitization of the industry. What keeps you up at night? What you know in your mind that if X, Y does not take place, this really is a problem that keeps me up. What keeps you up? What keeps you going? So so I'm actually more on the excitement stuff. I really do feel like a lot of this is in my control. So one of the things that has happened through relationships and connections is that Blue Banyan is, is writing the installer interface to Solar App. So the, the permitting software, right now you have to go up on the, the UI and and enter everything um, one by one. And mm-hmm. so we're building the interface so it can take it from whatever tool you've got and send it into the permitting app. You don't have to rewrite the address and all these things. Because we've got the relationships and everyone is so committed in the industry in general for the growth, they're willing to have us build the UI that is necessary. Um, we've got the orange button standards. We're using the Department of Energy's common text, you know, terminology with the orange button piece. So all of that is good, but there aren't any barriers for us. Like the level of innovation that is possible because the industry, the Department of Energy, the governments, the universities, um, and businesses in general are so committed to these changes. Literally, the thing holding us up is the number of hours in the day and the we have to sleep too. Like Mm -hmm. no one is putting up roadblocks for us to proceed. It is just like, Mm -hmm. yeah, obviously we should have that and feel free. So we're getting a super open path and being super welcomed (laughs) to (laughs) to, to drive this innovation. (laughs) So, So Jan, when you think about what makes your life easier, uh, what what is making your life easier? Is it is it the trillion dollar investment in infrastructure? Is it five uh, G and Internet of Things being available everywhere and people wanting to capture data now? Is it new standards on software? 
Is it the cloud being accepted for more and more things? Is it edge computing? What's what's making your life easier? So the Inflation Reduction Act and the tax credits are the number one thing making our lives easier relative to people committing to deploy mm -hmm. more solar faster. Mm -hmm. That is what is freeing up the capital and the interest and investment and growth in the solar installation world. I mean, it's super basic in terms of how that part is happening. Mm -hmm. The support that we're getting from everyone, I talked to Garrett Nilsson um, from the Solar Energy Technology Office mm -hmm. um, in June. And we talked about these common reference data sets and different pieces that we wanted to put into together that everyone could utilize. Mm -hmm. um, weather was is next on my list of ones that I'd like to tackle. Mm -hmm. And I think we need a, a common weather data set. And he was really excited mm -hmm. and engaged and open to all of these mechanisms. So everywhere that I have suggested that we do something more efficiently, one, we're still in this place where it's relatively obvious that that's a positive thing to do. So people are our game. And mm -hmm. then at Blue Banyan, we've proven that we can do it. The AHJ registry gets 100,000 hits a day from, from the, the internet in general. And mm -hmm. a third of them are from the website where individual companies, smaller companies, mom and pop companies are going in and just manually entering the address to get the AHJ with certainty. Mm -hmm. And the bigger companies are using the API access, mm -hmm. but it's sure. getting utilized every single day. It's making a difference. And that is also opening the doors for us to do the next level of innovation. Yeah. Let me ask you, let me ask you about uh, moving from the great state of California, eastward. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know, I think when I play golf with my with my group, if they see a solar panel, maybe they'll pick up a golf ball and try to knock it over there and knock it out. I just said that to get us going. <laughs> How do you see the adoption of um, what you're doing in other states? So I am from, uh, I live in Texas. And, and, and then, of course, there are states that's, that's passing laws, right, that would keep oil and gas, right, at the top of everything. How do you see your vision going away from, uh, let's call your state an experiment? How do you see taking that experiment worldwide or indeed to the rest of the country? Mm. So... A lot of what we're doing right now is U.S. specific. The product registry is the first really branching into international. But let's take a look at the AHJ registry, for instance. So the AHJ registry is getting used consistently, and California just passed a law, the Energy Access Act, that says that everyone, all of the AHJs of a certain size, which is a pretty small size, like 100,000 people or something, need to start using solar app by the end of 2023. So California is requiring adoption. Arizona and Texas have also got adopters um, that are working. So they're um, already engaged with the solar app, but we are literally expecting that California is gonna set the model and then the rest of the country is going to comply. The Inflation Reduction Act also has um, a, a provision saying that AHJs need to become compliant with solar app where it's equivalent. And it's very hard for me to see anybody constructing solar app from scratch. It's really intricate and involved um, across the country. So the California is requiring it first. The timelines in the Inflation Reduction Act are not yet there, but that the solar app tool for permitting, I am expecting to go, you know, across the country in four to five years. Mm -hmm. And Solar app is utilizing the AHJ registry and is also going to be utilizing the product registry to set the standards. Already the spreadsheet that the CEC, California Energy Commission, puts out for products is referenced by most of the other states. Just at whatever's on the CEC list is now our state list because they don't want to maintain a separate list themselves. With the exception of Massachusetts, they've got some extra little pieces that they put in there. 
but already most of the country is referencing the approach that California is using as the approach that should be used. It's kind of setting the, the leading standards for the country. And as it becomes legislated so that the 18,000 AHJs that issue solar permits all start doing it in the same way, it opens up this entire concept of builders of any variety being able to get electronic permits. So that's housing, decks, whatever. Well, we definitely need that, I think, in Austin. You know, I was I told <laughs> I told a guy I wanted to to look at my deck and he said, I'm looking at it already. You know, he was using <laughs> <laughs> He's using yeah, Google, no right? So so what you're saying is that we, as a matter of fact, for the consumer, uh, for the person, the family themselves or whatever. Permitting is a major issue. It might take a year to get a permit. Might might take two years to to get a permit. And now, of course, places like Austin, uh, you know, we, we're choking on the whole idea of, uh, of, of of permits. So, if I wanted to do a, a uh, you know a cross fertilization in the building industry, what would it change? What would the algorithm change to do just builders, for example? Uh, would you have to change a lot in the uh, so you have, I know you have the different kind of products and what you need and the expectations, what's required for building in a certain area. But but is anybody working on that? Uh, I'm sure there is that uh, the analog of you in other areas. Absolutely. So we have the key building codes, wind codes, fire codes that are necessary for solar installation. They, that must they must know what those codes are in order to build the appropriate permit. Um, in the AHJ registry already, but there's nothing preventing us from extending that. And we've been talking with uh, NYSERDA and some other really interesting organizations about extending the orange button taxonomy to include home efficiency and just energy efficiency of homes and just adding to the terms that you need to have. So what you need to have in order for this to work is you need to know the requirements so the AHJs have to be very specific and precise about each of their requirements. And then you need to know that the permit you're putting in and it just matches to those requirements. So the clarity on the AHJ side and the clarity on the installer construction side are the two pieces that you need. And then you just map them together. And if all of the answers are correct, it works. One of the, because this was done by NREL, of course, they have statistics and analysis, but one of the pieces that they found is that the inspection rates, they were worried that if you start submitting this electronically, people will just say whatever, and the inspection rates would actually um, get worse, that the number of solar installations that were below par would increase, and that didn't happen. The solar installers have their license and their interest is in doing it right the first time so they don't have to go back out again. And that natural incentive, when they digitized everything, they just needed to answer the correct questions to make sure they were meeting all the safety requirements. They wanted to do a good job and the inspection failure rates stayed the same. Mm -hmm. And that was spectacular news. So I think we can apply the same we do have to do the analysis and solar app has gone through and done the analysis. These are the building codes. So these are exactly the question lists that you need to answer. And then it, they've built it all out. So we still have to do that mapping for each of those different areas and electricians, plumbers, like each of them have their set of codes that you got to map to, but it's literally, it becomes a set of questions. We need to know the requirements and we need to know the, specific instance on the house and make sure it meets the requirements. And, 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 a total, one, two, three. and a total worth of this industry, that is that, 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 that you are looking at the total worth, you know, that you, you say, you know, we sell the total capital, capital worth of uh, computers are 9 trillion. What's the total worth if people are move into, into your space of the total industry, just, just take uh, what you're doing, just say the, um, um, the solar industry and not, let, let me let me it. before jan before jan answers if she has an answer let me give you some data from the office of energy efficiency okay. and renewable energy 
So according to them right now, the amount of solar installed in the US is two gigawatts, 2000 megawatts. The total production capacity, the powers, the entire production electricity sector, it's 1100 gigawatts. So, so we have installed two gigawatts and the industry is delivering 1100 gigawatts of everything, nuclear, coal, natural gas, solar, wind, everything else. So in the expectation, according to this agency, is that by 2050, solar will be 158 gigawatts. Now that is a gigantic number versus the two gigawatts of today. And Jan's company is gonna do phenomenal, but it's, it, is, it makes no dent in the 1100 gigawatts. <laughs> so, so it's it's, it's interesting. Basically, it's basically 20%. We need to wait until 2050. So my, my so my question, Jan, and, and maybe you can amplify the answer a little bit from uh, John asked, but it seems to me that if every household in America, 150 million homes, and every business in America, 28 million buildings need to put solar rooftops on them. We just don't have enough people doing it. And the workforce development need to learn to do this is huge. And one of our questions from Scott Foster was, why, why, why do schools and uh, you know, you know, school districts and, and universities are spending money on building stadiums and this and that? Why aren't we just teaching people how to do solar installs? <laughs> so, so there's a couple of things that I would love to know more about your stats, Andres. One of them is that if you look at how much we need for residential supply, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the denominator is less. So I think we have installed about 5% of what is needed for homeowners versus industry and some other supply, so right. some other consumers that need uh, absolutely. probably a different power supply altogether. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So that that would be an interesting nuance. I'd love to to see what you find. Yeah. The, the other element of this relative to really thinking about the labor force and how we're doing this is that the reason that we have you always have this pendulum swing. If you remember in computer science, we had mainframes and mm -hmm. then we bit, went back to everything has its own, you know client server devices, and yeah. now we've got the cloud and we're swinging back more towards something that looks like mainframes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're always going to have this tension between centralized and decentralized. Yeah. Um, and centralized is more efficient, but you have less control. And so, mm -hmm. and it's also a single source of failure. And decentralized, you've got control, but you also, you have to manage it yourself and you have to learn how to take care of things and whether or not you've got golf balls in your you know, marks and you've got to maintain it differently, right? You've got to take responsibility there. Mm -hmm. So there's pros and cons on, on each side of this pendulum swing. Mm -hmm. I think we are going through a swing where we are doing more decentralized solar yes. than we have in the past and energy construction in general. Mm -hmm. The utilities got really big, right? And, you know, PG&E didn't invest in infrastructure maintenance when it could, and then we had problems and then they went bankrupt. Yep. So there's a a natural and appropriate swing from mm -hmm. centralized to decentralized right now. Mm -hmm. I am not expecting us to stay there, particularly mm -hmm. because it's expensive compared to doing the utility scale and those, mm -hmm. you know, better solutions. I'm also expecting that hardware costs, um, soft costs are actually starting to go down. Mm -hmm. um, I hope, you know, we've got a part of, of reducing those soft costs that have been really mm -hmm difficult to get down for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. So as we're reducing these, the hard costs of the equipment and the soft costs of running the business, mm -hmm. I do think we can deploy more solar faster, but we're also going to, it's just going to cost so much less mm -hmm. to do it that we're going to find ways to get creative. So part of my algorithm and my thinking is presuming that the way I'm not projecting linearly that what we're doing now is how we're going to do it in the future. Mm -hmm. I am projecting that we have found all of these levels, these changes so far, and we're going to continue to find breakthroughs mm -hmm. that are going to enable us to install more later. Mm -hmm. The methods that we have today are not going to be the methods that we use in the future. Right. And that's going to, that's going to create some of the, 
benefits that we need, mm -hmm. even though we don't have existing methods to hit those metrics right now. Maybe maybe one of the future answers to solving the workforce development challenge is uh, instead of kids mowing lawns, they will learn to install solar panels. I actually would absolutely love that. And there, there's a tremendous amount. I have toys that I've given my children mm -hmm. to hook up solar panels to make their little robots go. Mm -hmm. So I am doing my part to make yeah. sure that we will have solar installer and electrician aware population in the absolutely. future. <laughs> it, it sounds like that I need to get me a fireplace. And also it sounds like I need to really <laughs> for the winter that's coming up. And, and it sounds like that I'm going back to the uh, to the dumb computer. You remember when I was in <coughs> graduate school, the old dumb computer where all of the software was on the mainframe, right? And now whenever I work, uh, you know, uh, Google wants me to save all of my papers and stuff on their, on, on their cloud on the mainframe. For what reason? I don't know why they want my papers. <laughs> right. So it's very, well, you better very believe they're indexing them all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so it's, but it's very, very interesting to look at how we communicate. And uh, and of course you got blockchain all in there and those kind of things. I, I guess my final question, one of my final questions would be, well, do you see a, a a hybrid in terms of let's say mainframe versus control and you know and, and a hybrid kind of situation? Because I've said before, as the price of cloud goes up, then people are going to say, hmm, maybe I can put that on the fourth floor. Mm hmm maybe I can put that in a closet and hire somebody to maintain it. Mm -hmm. I do think that we're going to um, <laughs> see some pieces of this come back, but I don't think we've gone all the way up to the cloud yet. I think we're actually still in middle ground with apps and the technology of being decentralized. I mean, my family has at least eight computers that I can think of off the top of my head. And with my family, we've got four people living here and we have at least eight computers and two of those people are seven and nine. So that's the number of devices and that it's already seriously decentralized. I don't think we've gotten to a place where people are feeling the pain of the centralization yet. It still feels like it's much better to have things on Google Cloud where you've got expensive engineers making sure it's backed up versus on my laptop that can get smashed by a roller skate anytime randomly. So I'm still, I still think we're in a place where we're going to shift more towards centralization before we shift back. Now, Andreas would tell you that we have have how many billion people hooking up to the, uh, on the internet of things. And that will have a big impact on clouds. It will have a big impact on, on, on lots of stuff as sensors of, the, of, of a smart cities uh, need to store stuff. And, and, and so therefore your house becomes, uh, you know, magnified by billions. And, and, but as that happens, you have the heat of the uh, clouds, where the clouds would be. Uh, how many clouds do we have in America now? Uh, do we need a backup? For the cloud, uh, we saw what happened to the airline industry when the uh, when the when the cloud went down. Nineteen sixty uh, <laughs> technology, we might add. So I mm -hmm. think looking forward, whether it's electric engineering or, or clouds, that that on the let's call it the Internet of Things, then the cloud will become more important. But what also will become become important is the hacking of the cloud, therefore cloud security. Uh, how much cloud, uh, so therefore, how much can you expand? And the cloud can go down. So it's, it gets to be pretty interesting, as you said, when you when you centralize things, you lose control. And, and, and when you bring it to yourself, you control, but then it might go away. You might step on it and break it, and then everything is gone. Right. So yes. I, have, I have a couple of questions for Jan real quick. Jan, what are your thoughts of edge compute and the cloud moving to the edge versus the current cloud? And how do you see that tension in that reality, primarily around life, life controls of real-time systems like the grid and many other things that the cloud really doesn't play a role in, on a daily basis for like SCADA or things like that. So how do you see that tension? 
I actually think the Ukrainian war is going to decide how this tension goes. Mm -hmm. So the one of my mentors is Clive Smith, and he's a South African. Mm -hmm. And South Africans are really tough individuals because they are used to a very authoritarian, controlling mm -hmm. state. Mm -hmm. And the United States is a relatively super trusting bunch of individuals mm -hmm. because we're just going to drown you in the data. And mm -hmm. who cares what kind of blanket I bought last night with mm -hmm. my kid to so they can have Barney on their, you know, sheets. Like yeah. they don't care. It's too much information. They've got the information, but I don't care. Who cares about that? Mm -hmm. And the United States is really casual about it. Mm -hmm. So I think the question is going to, what's going to drive whether you decentralize or centralize this is people's trust mm -hmm. of the centralized servers and how that information is used and kept. Mm -hmm. And right now for all of the difficulties that there have been, it's still so convenient. It's the Americans are happy to be trusting mm -hmm. and have Apple wallet out there, you know, keeping their flight tickets and all the other stuff that they're, that's integrated mm -hmm. at some point in time, if there's something that happens that breaks the trust of that centralized system, that's when we're going to see fracturing back to decentralized solutions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but it has to break the trust sufficiently to break through the convenience barrier right. that the centralized systems provide right now. Yeah. So that's my lesson for my South comes, African friend. Mm -hmm. When it comes back, we go right back to trust. It is exactly. really convenient, yes. right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so maybe, so maybe the debate will continue for a while as FTX is testing the waters and the naysayers of controlling private financial systems are saying the blockchain is never going to happen. But I don't know. We'll find out. I, final question. What is your take as a computer scientist on the impact of chat GPT on where we're heading? It is a game changer. We have already put it through its paces a bit and we just use it for debugging. If we find something like, how come this doesn't freaking work and are lazy, it will come back with a good answer and solve problems for us. So I am utterly impressed hmm. and it is making our efficient senior programmers more efficient already mm. Mm. in days. Mm. I could say I could say write me a chapter on Andre Cavalia and it and it would write it. I think <laughs> from a professor's point of view, you know, we had softwares to, you know, to to catch plagiarism. And the question is, will that software catch up? On the other side, I think that it should be utilized by universities and high schools to enhance learning. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to fight it, you know. I mean, you might, I might, I might, I might be lecturing to to a class, and I can say, well, let's talk about the history of business in uh, in uh, South Africa, and rather than having a textbook, there it is. Mm -hmm. You look at it as a textbook rather than something that you fight. That is is much more interesting. But it's a mess now. It's the M E S S. I can say, write me an entry letter to Harvard University. I write an essay on John Sibley Butler. Yeah. So, so one of the one of the uh, predictions from by many people, especially stock market people, is that uh, chat GPT is the Google search killer. Do you subscribe to that, both of you? What do you think? I think, I think no, I think that uh, Google will always be there for this generation. But yes, it will have a great impact because what, it, what Google does, it gives you definitions and it lets you look at stuff. It does not write stuff out for you. It, it has no uh, logic of stuff to write stuff, unless you're doing, uh, sometimes when I do uh, translations in different languages, mm -hmm. is it a killer? It could be. It mm -hmm. really could be because my yes. number one problem with Google is that I still have to scan and filter the information. Mm -hmm. yeah. If it can construct the information, how I want to see it and how I'm thinking about it already, mm -hmm. I totally would drop Google in a heartbeat. So, so if so, you so, so, totally, so I I actually never put that together, but my yeah, so, let, so let's fantasize for true. a moment that 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 Chat GPT had voice control 
and you could talk to it like Captain Kirk talks to the computer. And then I wouldn't, I wouldn't go to a textbook where I have to review everything. Right. I would just ask and be answered. Verbal information is so much faster for me than. Right. So I could totally see that. That is a shocker for me. You know, you're right. I mean, I spent eight hours a, a, a day in the library at Northwestern University. I haven't been to a library in years now, but I can go to any library, right? But mm -hmm. then, wow, if all of a sudden, what Google needs to do is to buy, <laughs> is to buy it right away. But if all of a sudden I can say, I'm traveling, I'm, I'm traveling to, uh, to Pennsylvania, Tell me the great sites I could see and tell me what I should watch out for. Mm -hmm. there's, so, there's... So, so here's here, so here's a final uh, interesting insight into the chat GPT open AI paradigm. They have an exclusive partnership with Microsoft Azure. With Microsoft? Who is maybe an investor. Should, maybe you should go work with Microsoft again. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I think all the other search engines are having a challenge right now. <laughs> yeah, they do, but they're not caught flat-footed, right? Google's got got a version of this as well. Yeah, Google has a version too. Well, they, it's, but what's fascinating is, um, you know, when you think about think about how you have to deal with your platform and the scaling behind it, and you know how many people are going to use it, da da da, right? I mean, imagine, imagine the planning and the thinking about the architecture of chat GPT, because, you know, it, it's the fastest adoption platform from zero to a hundred million people, three days. Yes. Wow. And I, I think that was like 75% of Lubanian. And that's what happened. Hot, you know, Hotmail did the same thing, remember. Uh, but, but if you really, what's interesting, I was working with a guy uh, Charles uh, started about eight years ago. He has the same thing for sports. So the Cowboys is playing uh, Philadelphia. Uh, tell me what they're going to do and how do I defend them? Bam. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Anyway, wow. we, could, we could stay here forever. Jan, you've been delightful. Thank you for the insights. We wish you continued success. We will hopefully have you again at the Digital 360 uh and sharing the the journey and the successes uh i think the sky's the limit for blue banyan if the two gigawatts are going to turn into 158 gigawatts that's a lot of work it's a lot of work and we are committed to doing our part so <laughs> let's watch take and make california. that happen <laughs> take care of california yeah, that's take right you thank you so much it's been a pleasure to be here you guys are so much fun Okay. Thank you, thank you. Johnny, take us away. All right. Come closer on that guitar. I don't know what's going oh. on with your mic. It's always now. Nothing ever goes away. Everything is here to stay. It's always now. It's always now. Never was it used to be. Everything is here with me. Always now. Raise your hearts. Save yourself some agony. Really, only you and me. It is always now. Is that better guitar? Beautiful. That was better. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you, Johnny. Yeah, we we'll still need to work on that mic. We need maybe a second mic for the guitar or something. That's yeah, it was anyway. So always a pleasure. Jan, thank you very much. Thank you Jan, very, thank you very much. much and take I'm care. gonna stop.